I gather I'm live, live now, but I can't tell it. I'm Anthony Watkinson. You can see me however you like to see me. I can only see myself as a little tiny square and my colleagues likewise, but we're being recorded and we're all ready to go. And I'm just going to say a very few things to start with, which I have, I was going to do slides I've decided not to do because it takes too long, especially with me doing them. Now, the idea is I put this some time ago to the director, other directors of the Charleston Conference that we should have use the opportunity to have more international in, input from people who normally wouldn't come to the conference. Uh, I always come to the conference, but I'm not the person concerned. My other two colleagues do not come to this conference. And there's Margot, you can see, from Germany and Gia from China. I've known both of them for some years, and Gia is a colleague. Now, I want to say something about the whole business of the impact of COVID-19, COVID the, the pandemic, as we call it, um, on the work of libraries, and particularly in this case for researchers. Now, I want to start by saying something about the project Gia and I are both engaged in, and I'm going to tell you a few things about it. Some, back in about 2016, Cyber Research, which we both belong to, did a project on um, called Har Harbingers of Change. And it was the, I'm just disappearing when I look for my notes. Um, it was the whole idea of the thing was we interview intensively early career researchers for three different years, that's 2016, 2017, 2018. And they would be interviewed by people in their own country. So the, the, there were seven countries altogether, including China, the UK, the US, uh, Spain, France, Malaysia, and Poland. And we did this and we've written, we've, there's masses of literature which we produced, because we publish a lot, uh, on our site, which is the cyber research site. C-I-B-E-R. Quite recently, we, we got together with the University of Tennessee, Knockville, Carol Tenapier, who you know, so many of you will know, and we put in a proposal for the Slo to the AP Sloan Foundation, who we've worked with before, and we planned a new project with the same sort of format, but adding Russia to the seven countries. And uh, this will be, is concerned with the whole of the scholarly communication system. So it's running on from the previous one, but it's also with a particular reference to the impact of COVID on the research of the early career researchers and the, or, and the whole system. So what I'm just going to say very quickly, I've got about four minutes to go now, is some key points. These are intensive interviews, and it enables us to establish a relationship with these early career researchers. Why early career researchers? Because they're the important researchers of the future. Now, um, one of the things that came out out of the last the 2016 to 2018 project was that early career researchers, millennials as many of them were, were really keen on openness, transparency, and sharing, but they did not foster open access. They did not publish open access because they felt that they had to publish in high impact journals, which would mean they be good for their climbing up the academic career ladder, as crudely put. Has this changed? This is our first question. Has it changed? In peer review, they were quite keen on double, double blind peer review, but they were terrified of open peer review. Has this changed? There are, there are arguments, PLOS has set, put forward arguments to say it has changed. We don't know. They rarely recognize the term open, acts, open science, even in 2018, but we are going to probe this for the future 
we're probing it by breaking up open science into more concrete, concrete practices. So it should make it possible for us to find out really whether they're into open science or not. There was a general wish for a transformation of the whole early uh, whole scholarly communication system. But none of them had, or almost none of them, had a clear idea what they wanted. Has this changed? There's all sorts of stuff in the blogosphere, which we see all the time, all of us here in this meeting will see all the time, but have, do the early career researchers see and understand this? They saw conferences are really important for them to gain visibility, to network, to find collab potential collaborators for the future. They, what are they going to do now? There are no conferences, uh, no serious conferences. We can't actually network properly at the virtual, uh, even if we try the virtual conference here today. Um, are they going to do more, be more interested in preprints? They seem to be. We know that people are being more interested in preprints. Are they using that for visibility? There is also the question of whether preprints will replace, as some people claim, the traditional journals and also if not preprints, the, the new, new platforms, the uh, open research platforms. Some people say they're going to replace the current journals. We don't know. We don't know what the early career researchers think about these things. Diversity inclusion, we didn't touch that last time because we felt it was too difficult to probe people about diversity and inclusion. What we're interested in now is finding out, particularly for women, women early career researchers, whether they're suffering from the widely suggested idea that it's because they tend to get a lot more childcare thrown upon them with the schools shut, when schools are shut, all that sort of stuff. There's some evidence here that it's affecting women particularly. Early career researchers are the research workhorses. They are already precarious position has been undermined by remote working. Is, are they being forced to do a lot of drudge work which they were not doing previously? Work normally te technicians would do. And has funding, is funding going to be very difficult for the future? I'm now finished at 522, uh, 522 Greenwich Mean Time, which I'm on at the moment. I'm going to hand over to Gia, who will speak from now. Hi, hello, everybody. Uh, it's my great pleasure to join this uh, webinar, and uh, it's my first time to attend this conference. Uh, I enjoyed myself very much so far, and it's already midnight in China, and I'm here in Wuhan. So uh, I guess everybody is curious about how uh, since going on here in China, especially in Wuhan. Uh, uh, I, 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 I can tell you something about the COVID and its influence on, on, on Chinese academies and higher education and uh, from my experience of uh, my, from the university. But today I'm going to talk uh, more about the uh, uh, the, the new policy that China made uh, for the evaluation system. Um, yes, as you can see, uh, the COVID-19 uh, has great impact on uh, all our, our lives and our research. Uh, from February to late April, um, all universities in China was closed. Teachers and students at the university participate online teaching and learning via different uh, internet platforms to overcome setbacks, setbacks caused, caused by pandemic. Uh, during the lockdown, the university libraries provide online service and make sure researchers and students can get what they need in time. Uh, for example, in my university, the um, digital library that we can use from everywhere of the country, uh, and uh, it still provides good quality service. With this uh, service, we can do our research. Um, and in May, with the control of the Pandemic. Most of the universities in China open again and welcome the new students. Um, but during this uh, lockdown, there's a uh, breaking news. Maybe you have heard that in February, China launched a radical reform uh, of research evaluation and finding. Two policy documents published by the Ministry of Science and Technology and the Ministry of Education. 
they outlined a move away from current strong focus on bibliometric indicators based on the Web of Science database. Uh, in their place comes a more balanced combination of measurements and peer review, uh, saying qualitative measurements, with a great emphasis on publishing in domestic journals. Universities are being urged to implement the policy by the end of Ju July. Uh, how to do it and the possible consequences have aroused the inten uh, intense discussion among Chinese academics and gained worldwide attention. Uh, so it's it's already November. We've saw some um, uh, list has published by some universities and uh, academies that they pro provide uh, recommend the, the, the journals that they want their uh, researchers to publish with. And they also issued some um, blacklist to warn their uh, researchers um, they, they don't wish researchers uh, do not publish in those journals in blacklist. So we, we've seen they have they have done something. But um, I in my eyes that China's new policy um, Actually, it indeed mirrors the initiatives in other parts of the world, such as the San Francisco Declaration of Research Assessment and Leiden Manifesto for research metrics and the EU, EU European policy for responsible research and innovation, such uh, like this. But none of these initiatives has been provided easily solutions. Other countries will therefore recognize both China's aims and some of the problem they face. Uh, to my eyes, the, one of the biggest problem of this new policy is that maybe it, China has been underestimated uh, how difficult to make such um, evaluation system uh, could be. Until now, uh, Chinese researchers have been encouraged to think global in their publishing. Some of them are happy to leave this policy of globalization behind, but for most Chinese pop, uh, researchers, especially the young researchers, we call early career researchers, they are um, very get, they're getting used to publishing in international journals. Uh, according to our research in the past three years, Young researchers in China generally publish more internationally than their older colleagues. And they are more concerned that support for collaborating and uh, publishing globally. Um, this has been constant in China about locally useful uh, research being published in remote English journals. Chinese researchers, for example, published one of the first uh, uh, scientific articles warning of the uh, coronavirus in the Western to international. One minute to go, Jia. One minute to go. Okay. Yeah. Uh, before the uh, pandemic was widely known in China, so this this could be a problem. That's this the one of the motivation uh, that Chinese government wants to uh, push this uh, new policy and uh, change their publishing uh, the outlets into more domestic journals. So I'd like to discuss in details this, but uh, but for now, I, I just close my talk <laughs> and give this. Yeah. Over to Margot. Hello, Margot. Margot is not a colleague of mine, but I've known her for some time. And I, she's she's come up with a very another provocative idea, which I think will be quite stunning to some of the people here. Margot, please go ahead. Um, first of all, thank you for the invitation and thank you for being able to be here. I added some links to Gia's talk in the chat for those taking part and I will just post some of the links that I will mention and they'll be in the chat. So, and now I need to search for my one slide. And I will... share my screen to you. There we go. So, seven minutes. Yes. My name is Margot Bagheer and I'm German, as you can hear, meaning that I'm part of the 12th largest language area. It's spoken in four major countries and in 18 minorities. 
such as the Deutsche Amerikaner in Pennsylvania. And I think the American attendees are aware that, for instance, Germantown is for American history an important town. So until World War II, German was among the most important science languages, mainly in physics, chemistry, philosophy. Why that isn't the case, you are probably aware of. And nevertheless, most of the teaching in German university is still done in German, although English, of course, is a lingua franca, especially for the natural sciences and for those sciences that cooperate um, globally. However, our early career researchers are finding themselves in a similar situation as Chinese or all over the world that they um, seek to streamline them themselves and their research to a publishing system that is over proportionally bent towards English as a language. And this is not just because English is a convenient uh, lingua franca, otherwise we couldn't be here if we, ha if we hadn't this um, English as a common language that we can use to meet. But it's also because the publishing system is dominated by those publishers relying on English being the most predominant language in sciences. So it favors those big five. It obviously narrows down the discourse for bibliodiversity. For us in German, because uh, in Germany we are a big language area, we can nevertheless still train our teachers who teach children in school. And um, we can also, uh, so in our universities, we are able to teach science in German, meaning we have German school books, we have German speaking teachers who can teach biology. If you enter a country like Denmark, biologists start to run out of Danish words to teach their own science to their own society. And this obviously is not just about a folkloristic um, need, ah, we need to protect Danish as a language. This is really uh, running into a problem. So some of, some of these smaller language areas run the risk of running out of words. And this is why I included, you can see here, um, how do you say wash your hands? Yes, that's a, that's a fairly easy scientific con concept. We do need to wash our hands to protect ourselves from coronavirus. In Malayalam language, it would be basa tangan anda. But we have more complicated concepts of science and we run out of words if we don't protect local, regional and um, other um, languages. The point is that what can we do as librarians? What can we do if, as information specialists and those running the infrastructures? Is for instance, if we support multilingualism, this is not just some folkloristic um, notion, some ethical notion. This is not just about the, the speakers and the readers. This is also about what is being said. So if, for instance, our American colleagues subscribe to more Spanish journals, those will be not local or regional journals. This will be journals from the largest, one of the largest language areas. And there is more people speaking Spanish than there are people speaking English as a native language. So this is not just, just about helping readers and speakers. This is also about opening up the scientific content that is locked in these language areas. And I think what we all need to do, and this is also for, for someone like uh, coming from a medium language area like me as a German, we do need to visit our blind spots and we do need to look at where do we exclude what and whom with focusing on either our own language or focusing on English as the, oh, that's the scientific language because that's um, obviously narrowing down the the discourse. And what we also can do is um, move beyond the paradigm that we have to streamline our research to the needs of the bigger publishing companies and the needs and obviously web of science over proportionally favors English as a language because that suits their business case. And they're not to be blamed for that because that's their job. They are stock market. 
and they need to meet their shareholders' values needs, and they also need to survive in a competitive market. So it's up to us as the infrastructure specialists and the librarians to make sure that we foster a publishing system that embraces bibliodiversity and multilingualism. And this is to um, use the words of Vandana Shiva, this is a way out of getting out of a monoculture of the mind, because if we let it happen that we move into a linguistic monoculture, we lose content, we lose speakers, we lose readers, and we lose as societies. So, I'm done. Okay, thank you very much indeed, um, Margot. That was wonderful, very, very provocative indeed. Have, I, have we provoked anybody yet? Hmm? No? Don will know. Don will put, his, put them on when soon as somebody is provoked and comes up in chat, because we can't see that, of course, at the moment. Okay, we can, we can only see our own chat and okay, we can chat. post to other people, but other people can't post to us. Okay, that's good. So what, let me just go back on, it's good because China has quite a strong, a large literature, uh, Gia, hasn't it? Um, I mean, how much, how vigorous is the Chinese literature in science now? Is it going away gradually or is it still strong? Um. As far as I know, there are about 6,000 uh, Chinese STM journals. Yeah. Mm, well, yeah, uh, yeah, quite a lot, but um, they are relatively not um, open to overseas readers because they don't have any English uh, titles, abstract, they only for the domestic market. Um, for a few subject disciplines, they are must read journals, but for the rest of, and the, I would say the most uh, uh, part of the research researchers, they don't really need to read these Chinese journals. So it's a big dilemma that um, we publish mm -hmm. so many STM journals in Chinese language, and they don't get really high um, quality papers in. Or, High quality paper went outside for English international journals. What about uh, German? There are quite a lot of, in certain subjects, there are quite a lot of German journals, aren't there? For example, in dentistry, which I used to know very well, dental, dental research. This, uh, it depends on a bit. And I think what we need to do is that we look at the scientific discourses in their differentiation. So, of course, there are German um, journals, for instance, aiming at oncologists and dentists at practitioners. And this is important that they can read in their own language because the dentist will talk to his patients, mm -hmm. most likely in German or in Chinese or in Danish or Croatian language. So this is important that they have something like a wording and um, a communication going in, in this language. But then when it comes to tenure and promotion, we suddenly force, especially early, re um, early career researchers to start something like a double life. So they need to communicate in their daily life or when, when it, uh, it's about science transfer into society, they need to be familiar and they need to be fluent in their own language. But when it comes to, and I, re I deliberately use that word competing internationally, they suddenly need to play somewhat, someone else's turf, which is not their turf. And this, um, this creates problems because then tenure and promotion, at least in China, this is also, it was also the case until February. And I really, really embraced the chains of policy um, so so we, we force researchers into competing in, in a language that is not theirs. And we sort of, uh, and, and the publishing system has sort of made themselves feeling guilty that they can't use that language like a native speaker. So um, there has been lots of services coming up and in language editing, making your research fit for the so-called international journals and the international journals to be, to be really frank, those are English speaking journals. A Spanish journal is also an international journal. 
a Chinese journal read by Korean scientists is also an international journal. So we have sort of allowed that the term international is mainly coined as English speaking. And if we start to at least simply acknowledge it so that we have forced our, um, our research as into competing in two disciplines, meaning they have to work, they, for instance, have to teach in their own language or German scholars in Germany have to teach in German, but they have to write and publish in English as if they were native speakers. And there the system starts to get distorted for the, the natural sciences. It sort of didn't become so obvious because the language is used as a reporting tool. So you describe your methods and your processes and there's something like a common wording and there is common terms of expression. But whenever we move aside from sort of reporting the art sciences, we really run into a problem because then language is not just a, a reporting mechanism, language becomes a tool, a research tool. A philosopher or a library scientist absolutely needs this language to sort of dig into concepts and say, what are we doing here? You can't uh, develop a, a data model for including library content if you don't dig into language, because language then is a precision tool, not just some rough um, reporting mechanism. Mm -hmm. European university presses. You, you, the pres president, are you chairman, chairperson now of the organization? Yeah. Yeah. And do they mainly, mainly, do your press mainly publishes in German, does it, or entirely in German? Um, most of these library run publishing units will publish what comes to them. Mm. So if our researchers would only publish in German, we would publish with them in German. Not because we think German is the most important language, no. it ab absolutely isn't. But if, if this is what they need to communicate with their peers in, this mm. is what we will do. But we do have more and more English speaking content. And this is, I mean, if we have, we have social anthropologists, for instance, mm. publishing mm. Mm. at our university press, and they need to bring back their research to their people. But if they would write their books in Indonesian language or in Malayalam, yes, then some speakers can read their research, but not their international colleagues. Mm -hmm. And most in, in some of the smaller university presses in continental Europe and in Europe, their job, their main role is to make sure that scientific content is published in local, regional, national languages. Mm. And not just for the sake of the language as such, but to make sure that science can be transferred to society mm. without mm. loss of meaning and precision. And this won't be possible if we don't cling to our national and local and regional languages, because mm. then we lose precision, as I mentioned with the Good. example yeah. of Danish biologists running out of Danish terms for mm. biology concepts. Mm. Dear, how does that sound to you? Um, that as a from a Chinese point of view, what the thesis that uh, Margot is putting forward, how does it sound to you? Does it sound sensible? Mm. Mm, yes. Uh, and in one hand, uh, the the Chinese journals need to get more uh, international uh, outlets to get more readership and authorship from the interna international uh, academia. But on the other hand, there is a problem that a lot of Chinese uh, learned journals um, they they facing a very fierce competition. Uh, compared to their international uh, competitors, and they are struggling with uh, getting, as I said, good quality paper in, and um, and the new policy I think uh, we mentioned in in uh, issued in uh, J January, they will uh, give more opportunity and provide more 
financial aid, for example, for uh, Chinese journals to develop them themselves. Uh, um, so I think there's a need for domestic market too, and there's a need for um, some disciplines that they need to uh, have good Chinese uh, language journal. So I public I, I agree with what uh, Bargers. We have we have two uh, questions yeah. here at last. That's wonderful. How wonderful people. One of whom is related to me. The other one I know very well. Uh, we were very fortunate. Katina Stark has. Um, come up and she is as people you may not know but she is the founder of this wonderful conference and uh, she's asked do we need more translation in english or other languages as well as for chinese and german journals um and then my son charles watkinson the university press of michigan has asked another question which the people can you can read it everybody can read it i guess yes so Katina's question, do we need more translations in English or other languages, as well as for Chinese and German journals? Um, if I'm, I, I will briefly give an answer to the second and then give an answer to the first and I'll be short here. Yeah, so because I think it's really good if you also answer this. What we absolutely need is that we at least have something, and, and you mentioned that already, we need the metadata and the abstracts in more languages than just one. Mm -hmm. And right. because this helps discovery and this helps librarians and it also helps people who search for content because the, these tools for translating content automatically and with machines these tools are powerful, but these tools won't help us in discovering. And if we at least always add something like a, a multilingual abstract or multilingual metadata, then we help the discovery. And then people can decide whether they go through the pains of translating it or finding someone, but at least they will know, hey, there is something. So we do need more internet, uh, we need more multilingual traces of content in the web and i think that helps already so and then um charles says as we move towards ebooks and open access how should we engage with the challenge that many book markets remain predominantly print-based this is a huge challenge because it's not that um, one thing is readers of humanities and social science will most likely prefer to read the long argument big thing in print, because that's the way we as physical human beings interact with content most easily. And this is not going to go away, but also there I would say, let's at least start with a discovery. Yes, a book can sit there mm -hmm. in print, mm -hmm. but if everything is predominantly organized around the print, so metadata are always for print dissemination, books only appear in platforms that rely on sales of content, either as a print book or an ebook, then we never get out of this paradigm. But what we also need to understand is that the book as a cultural concept is hundreds of years old and it's a huge cultural success. And that cultural success comes from its physical form, from the way it was disseminated and brought to us. So only if we understand that uh, ah, let's do away with all this print stuff and who needs that? That's not the way to move forward, to, but to say what kind of stepping stones to help the eBooks and especially the open access books, what kind of stepping stones from the print world can we use to move forward? So for instance, we always print books at our university presses and most of the continental European presses or those presses who do open access books, they will also print a book not because they are some kind of nostalgic, ah, oh, we no, need the printed no. book, but because as soon as there is a printed object that moves into the market of printed goods, there are more metadata around, there is more visibility, and that helps the open access content. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. We have two, two more quick questions. Have you, um, Gia, have you anything to say to what my yeah. son asked? Yes, go. Yeah. Uh, firstly, I want to uh, I, I want to comment on Bagger's uh, 
comments that uh, I, I totally agree what she said about the metadata and the translate the abstract and the metadata into a different language. And uh, and I think it's maybe more useful that we, we, um, we did uh, another language in social media for showcase. Uh, that's what we we did for Chinese journals. We we don't uh, when uh, we we translate uh, Chinese journals abstract into English, and we make them um, we make them uh, on the uh, international uh, social media, and uh, we did the same thing to the English journals too. We we have the uh, we chats, uh, official accounts, something like that, that we can translate English journal uh, abstract and we make the longer abstract, more extensive uh, abstract into Chinese to make more showcase. To We use the social media to uh, communicate with the target audience and make it more uh, visible. Uh, and I think it's quite useful. And uh, I'd like to uh, answer the question, uh, the translation of articles of whole journals may be different a discussion from the translation of books. Yes, indeed, it's much more easier to translate article and uh, papers into English um, than uh, to do uh, it with a book. Um, and I have an example here. Um, uh, in China, we, we, uh, we had a lot of uh, finding that supports uh, good works, especially the humanity and the social science books. Uh, to translate into other languages, uh, and we have some funding um, to do some, such kind of thing. But the most difficult thing is not money. It's not. It, it's it's the translator. We don't have good translator. We we need we really, we really need academic to do such kind of thing, um, and uh, uh, it uh, we we pay a lot. But sometimes we don't just get the right people to do the right thing, and uh, come back to. Uh, another question that uh, the would Google Translate will be uh, mm, work? Mm. I think uh, I, I think with the development of technology, especially the AI and uh, the computer technology, uh, the uh, I, I think Google Translate did much better than like five years ago. And uh, some of my students they they firstly write English papers and then they use Google Translate to make the rough translation uh, as the base for um for for development and then they translate they, they they polish the language themselves and some of them can get even published in english journals so i think it's useful but i don't think it can solve out all the problems especially for the very um very unique and the spe specified specified uh, subject such as archaeology or humanity subject like Chinese history is very difficult for translate. So, Ramuna, just trying to understand what Ramuna is asking. Translations and articles of the whole journals may be a different discussion for the translation of books. I think we already agreed to that. It's very nice to have such a distinguished group of questioners. Can I ask, I'll ask a question of, of, of Gio? Um, this is something which is more for publishers which I was for many years, as you know, um, is who is going to be, where, where are the Chinese uh, researchers going to um, publish in the new environment in China? Will there be a preference for Chinese owned publishers or will they still be interested in publishing with the large companies or what sort of new publishers will spring up which are run by learned societies, perhaps? There's a joint one with Elsevier and um, the, um, what is it? <laughs> I've forgotten the organization mm -hmm. now. The, the science, mm -hmm. uh, you know, what's it called? That KEA, KEA, is it KEA? Oh, there's a sort of thing yes. that's going to yeah. come about. Yeah, joint yeah. venture company. Yeah, venture, I know yeah. what is what your question is, and it's a good question. Um, that new policy, uh, emphasize more on Chinese published journals. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean Chinese language journals. It's encourage uh, Chinese uh, publishers to publish good quality, uh, reputable English journals together with foreign uh, uh, publishers such as Elsevier, Springer Nature, 
uh, and a lot of uh, Chinese, uh, a lot of international publishers, big ones, they are, they have uh, branches in China. They go, they did good mm -hmm. business. They did very well. Um, and I think uh, under the new uh, circumstance, uh, there are more uh, joint venture companies will come, uh, and there's still um, opportunities for for uh, international uh, publishers to to launch new journals together with Chinese uh, universities or even academies. Uh, see what's what's CAS Chinese Academy of Science did. Yeah. They yeah. they have good yeah. yes relation uh, cooperation with a lot of uh, Western publishers. Mm -hmm. So um, I. I, I see there are uh, opportunities, not only uh, threatens. Can I go back to books again? Because I realize it's the Charleston Conference is very, very much more interested in books than in journals. Uh, I'm more interested in journals, but I like books as well. And I wanted to ask a question to Gia particularly, but also to you, Margot. You're both involved in publishing uh, journals and books. Um, Geo publishes three journals, I think, yourself, don't you, from your operation? Is it just three or three yeah. bit more? Um, there's, um, what do you think about library run, Margot? How do you feel the question, library run university presses movement is going? Uh, I mean, as I say, Charles Watkinson here is a library run university press. Uh, and there are quite a number in the states, but are they beginning to take on, um, become more, 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 more of them? Do you think, or is it a back, is it something going backwards or forwards? Do you think, Margot? Um, if we look at the numbers of university presses in Europe, I think we are at a phase where some of the libraries realize if you want to run a university press yourself, you need to do it at a high standard, because there are so many good presses already around that you can't start like I started getting in university press ago and in, in, back in 2002. I, hadn't, I didn't have any clue how to start a press. It's, it's a sort of luck that it survived and that it made, <laughs> made it into its uh, puberty. But the, if you start it now, the competition and the standards are high and you can't just do anything you need to do something reasonably good because there are presses out there that can um, help those especially the open access needs um, so it's we won't see many more popping up here boop, 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 there but what i can tell from evidence is that they create an impact so the most important German research funder is the German Research Foundation. And they issued an open access program just a few days basically ago. And for the first time you can apply for your DFG funded project for funds for open access books. This has never been the case before. Not because the German Science Foundation didn't embrace books, but they found that a funding scheme was way too complicated and they couldn't, they couldn't get it through their boards. So it, it, you basically had to find the money yourself. So now for the first time, if you run a um, project with their money, with their funding, you can apply for funds to publish an open access book and the quality criteria, what makes a really good open access books these quality criteria have been written by the group of university presses. So there are really pragmatic things in there. What license you should issue, what it should have, should have a persistent identifier such as a DOI. So mm -hmm. simple recommendations, but also stronger ones like how can you calculate your costs? And because these university presses are run within libraries, but at the same time, they have to offer industry standard services. We understand that publishing is not, it's not like a putting stuff on a repository or a preprint server. It takes money and effort and it takes skilled people. And so the, the number, the, the calculations that publishers offer and say, this is how much we need to charge for, for an open access book. This is now run against the experiences 
of library-led publishing houses. That we won't break the oligo oligopolistic situation mm -hmm. that um, the, large, the larger publishers have created and everybody has contributed by making use of their great services. But we, we sort of, um, these library-led publishing houses, they sort of correct the reality and say, yes, publishing takes effort, it takes competencies, it won't come for nothing, but it can be done a bit differently. Well, thank you so much. Although I'm told now it's exactly six o'clock, so we have to finish, but thank you for, for both the, the, the two panelists who, I, as I suspected, there, what they were saying was really interesting. What I would say was just not very interesting. <laughs> but I, um, I, I hope, um, I think just as Charles Watkinson asked a question, I think I should mention that Michigan Publishing has a, uh, a booth here on the vi virtual vendors op operation, which you can still go to, I think. And I suggest look at it because they're a very interesting example of a, uh, of a university, of a library run press. So thank you very much, everybody. Nice to, no, sorry not to see all the, all the 50 people in the audience, but there we are, that's life. It seems unnatural, but thank you, Don, for so much for looking after us. What do I do now? I leave, do I leave? Oh, we well, leave? at least thank you for everybody to attend and thank you to Gia and you. Anthony to organize this. Thank you. It has thank been an um, honor. Thank you for thank all. You. Thank mm. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Take care. Bye bye. Bye.